Hello. This is a presentation of Society in Progress inside Washington's Black membership organizations, sponsored by the Friends Meeting of Washington Change Committee on Racial Equity. I'm your presenter for today, Rashid Darden. I'm a native Washingtonian and a novelist, and I'm a member of Friends Meeting of Washington. I'm currently a resident of Conway, North Carolina, and I am and have been an enthusiast of the Black membership organization experience for much of my life. I am a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. I became a Prince Hall affiliated Freemason through the Grand Lodge of Maryland. I am the national president of Gamma Xi Phi, the fraternity for artists, and I'm in a small civic and social organization called the Apollonians. I'm really excited to present to you some of my research today. So if you're like me and like much of America, you paid pretty close attention to the primary elections and the general election last year for president of the United States. In that process, we noticed Kamala Harris throw her hat in the ring. And almost immediately, there were think pieces, articles, uh, in-depth essays, and uh, pieces on national media about Kamala's so-called secret weapon, the Sisters of Alpha Kappa Alpha. Uh, Kamala Harris attended Howard University, where as a senior, she pledged the Alpha chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, where the sorority was founded in 1908. Now, although Kamala is also an honorary member of the Lynx Incorporated, another black women's organization, it's truly her membership in AKA that has gotten a lot of attention for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, AKA is a pretty large organization and almost immediately the members of the sorority supported their sister in their candidacy, not because they were instructed to, not because there was an obligation to do so. Politics are very often kept out of the conversation in, in black organizations. However, there you know, Kamala very much represented the hope and the dream of her founders, even if they never once said or might not have even believed that there could be a black woman in line for the presidency someday. But it's sort of what every organization hopes for, that their own member will someday be the person in charge of the nation. And almost immediately, Kamala sorority sisters made donations to her campaign, uh, and, you know, they weren't million dollar donations. Very often they were symbolic donations of $19.08, 1908 being the year of the founding. So in this process of observing Kamala's uh, rise as the vice president of the United States and using her platform to talk about her membership in AKA, and being part of the Divine Nine or the National Panhellenic Council of which AKA is a member, it became more and more interesting to me as someone who's always been an enthusiast of such organizations, what it means now that our organizations are on the national stage, but more specifically what it means as a Washingtonian uh, who has joined an organization uh, me being the Washingtonian and Kamala being at least a temporary Washingtonian when she was in uh, Howard University. And other questions arose like, well, what does it mean to be a Howard joiner? What does it mean to be a UDC joiner? So all of these questions really bubbled up for me in the process of this election and all of the media attention that uh, AKA received as a result of Kamala's candidacy. So as a writer, I thought about, well, what could my next steps be as someone who has been an enthusiast for so long, for someone who generally supports black membership organizations, and for someone who has so much pride in being a native Washingtonian, I decided that my guiding question for my project would be, why does it seem like joining a black membership organization is the thing to do in DC? Why do, why is this such an accomplishment? Why are even people that are not in organizations themselves 
beaming with pride when someone becomes a member of such an organization. There are not more AKA members than there are registered Democratic voters, but it seems like AKA in this case led the way and really set the tone and the pace for what belonging to an organization could mean to the general public. So I decided to look at that question and to think about all of the organizations in DC, Masonic, Greek, civic, social, and figure out the why. Why is it the thing? Okie doke. Okay, wonderful. So the book is called Joining Society, a survey of the Black membership organization experience in the District of Columbia, 1825 to 2020. So depending on how long it takes, it might be 2025. But that is the, the point of the book that I'm working on. So let's start by having a working definition of Black membership organization. I figured for the benefit of everyone on the call, you should know that a, a BMO or a Black membership organization, as I'm defining it, is a group of people of African descent who assemble for a common purpose. That purpose is typically going to be service to the community and the promotion of some sort of social kinship and who intend for the organization to exist in perpetuity. That is how we're defining a BMO for this conversation. A BMO is gonna have three defining traits. The first is gonna be intangible selection criteria. And what we mean by that is joining a black membership organization is not like walking up and applying for a job. It is about simply whether or not the people are feeling you. Do they like you? Do they want you to be part of this thing that they are building and propagating and, and continuing? You could be picked for no reason, for good reasons, or not be chosen for good reasons or bad reasons. But the fundamental uh, trait is that it is intangible. It is not necessarily about merit, although merit might take, you know, it might have be part of the conversation. The second defining trait of a black membership organization is that it's going to have some level of privacy or secrecy, typically with rituals, ceremonies, and esoteric traditions. For some organizations, that might be as simple as the meetings being private. For other organizations, the traditions might be more elaborate and Byzantine, such as the Freemasons with their, their jeweled collars, with their aprons and their fezes. Fezes are cool. And the last part is a black membership organization is going to have some level of community prestige. And by that, I mean, for those of you who are not African-American and not necessarily in this world, you might have gone to college and seen fraternity and sorority life and thought, eh, I could take or leave Tri-Delta. I could take or leave the Teeks or the Deeks, whatever. And you could live your whole life and not be influenced by your lack of membership in that organization. In Black membership organizations, for various reasons, one being that there are fewer of them, it's not really so. There's a certain level of prestige that comes along with being a member of, say, Martin Luther King's fraternity. It gives you a direct-ish a direct -ish line to the civil rights movement, to people that have done things that are movers and shakers. And that presence of the community prestige is really a hallmark of a BMO, whether it is an earned prestige or a prestige that they say that they have. I do want to add that for those of you who have ever thought about, please mute yourself. Thank you. Thank you. For those of you who have ever thought about the hazing that takes place in some uh, fraternities and sororities. Okay, I hear a little bit of feedback. Whoever is not muted should please mute themselves. Thank you. One of the reasons that hazing persists in some of these organizations is because there is a very real benefit to joining. And, you know, nobody's going to promise you a job, but 
doors are being opened and networks are being continued on your behalf should you get this kinship. So the reason that they're, one of the reasons that there are people who don't walk away from the prospect of hazing is because there's a more tangible benefit to membership in the long term than there might be for a similarly lettered organization that is predominantly white. So those are the three traits. My approach to this work, joining society, uh, is has about five lanes to it and five reasons that I'm doing it the way that I'm doing it. First, it's going to be chronological. It's going to start from the beginning. It's going to start from 1825 and really tell the story logically from that point. I'm a lover of timelines. I really enjoy uh, you know, reading about things in the order that they happened with the context along the way. It will be historical. It's not just a list of facts like, you know, like a timeline would be. There's going to be a lot of discussion of context and a lot of discussion of DC history along the way. I love Washington. I hope you love Washington uh, as well. And there's going to be bits of DC history that are germane to the overall story of Black membership organizations. It will be sociological. One of my favorite books about any Black membership organization is In Search of Sisterhood, The History of Delta Sigma Theta. And, and really because it's very much a social history as much as it is a straight history of an organization. It'll be analytical. I will be taking time to really look at a lot of the data that I uncover in this process and, and come to some conclusions about it. And it'll also have an element of genealogy. And by that, I mean not just family ties and family relationships, but that I want to name names as much as possible so that in the public record, there are people whose names might not have been mentioned because their organization didn't have, you know, the clout or the membership numbers. But there are so many organizations out there with people that have contributed. I want to make sure that this work has its proper place among those who are doing searching about individual people. Thank you so much for your patience. So this book will start with setting the stage. Again, I'm a lover of DC history. And the section uh, that will be about pre-1825 is going to talk a lot about just how DC came to be as a city, which I think is a fascinating story in and of itself. It was not built on a swamp. Please run tell that. It is not true that DC was built on a swamp. And then the book starts in earnest with a chapter about rising freedom and about the Freemasons and how they came to be established as the first uh, organized, the first Black membership organization in D.C. And all of the all the sections, you know, I have one that's not titled yet. I don't know what we're going to call 1931. Uh, in the 70s, we talk a lot about the LGBT presence expanding into Black membership organization culture. And a very interesting thing is Black Washington had a lot to do with the changes in how people who are members of organizations interact with one another. Uh, the, well, I won't get into the details of that, but the boundaries fell in the digital age as and people in our organizations in DC got to really be influenced by and influence other organizations outside of the Beltway. So here's some preliminary answers I found to the question, why does it seem like joining a Black membership organization is the thing to do in DC? Um, first and foremost, and, and, and for some of these, you know, the, the answers will be obvious to some of you, and it might not be as obvious to others. There were economic, very real economic and educational opportunities in Washington in the 1800s that attracted free Black people. And those free Black people worked on building projects in the federal government eventually seeking you know, and securing employment in the federal government and in the DC government, the post office. And those people who came here to work to find uh, economic opportunity and educational opportunity with the establishment of Howard University, they also needed safe places to assemble and to organize. So we're really talking about the 1800s versions of self-care and social justice organizing. Um, the other place where you would see these things happening would be in African-American churches. So aside from the church and home life and family life in and of itself, you would have organizations like the Freemasons 
that were that would establish get established and have conversations among the members. In fact, many of the early Black Freemasons in D.C. went on to establish schools, businesses, and other things that uplifted the community. The next thing that happened rather sequen sequentially, but also concurrently, is social stratification itself. So the more opportunity you have, the more opportunity there is to divide yourself between the haves and the have nots. And really what we're talking about is the separation from the pastoral life that Southern black and formerly enslaved people and sharecroppers left behind in favor of urban life. So, you know, people didn't want to remember the plantation. People didn't want to remember what they had escaped from. And the more closely you were associated as being from that lifestyle, you weren't seen as, you know, part of the new culture, which is one that many people in the newly established Black middle and upper, upper classes wanted to see, wanted to be seen as parallel to the same things in white culture. Of course, the wealth was not there like it was among white organizations and white people and communities and neighborhoods and whatnot, but there was an emulation of those things because they were not pastoral, they were not rural, they were not agrarian. The social stratification both emulated uh, white things and white culture, but also rebelled against those same norms. So and hopefully we'll get to that uh, in a little bit. These organizations also, these entities and organizations also incubated black leadership. So you establish an organization, it is kept alive, it does things, it does positive things, and then that creates a legacy for your children to th then join and follow in those footsteps. And even if the emulation was not, if the incubation of that leadership was not necessarily a legacy from father to son, for example, uh, Daniel Murray, who we'll discuss a little bit later, it might be that they take up the baton and do something different. Daniel Murray was in the Diamondback Club, but his son, Nathaniel Murray, co-founded Alpha Phi Alpha. So again, you'll see those, those, the thread of that DNA all throughout these generational experiences. And finally, the social norms themselves that the organizations upheld were not just for the organization, they were seen as the standard by those outside of the organizations. So even if you, for example, go to Howard and don't pledge Alpha or AKA or Q, you are still very much influenced by their presence on the campus. And if the campus is telling you well, these are the top people on the community, if these are the top people in the community, you're still gonna walk away feeling, well, that's the 10%, that's the 1%, that's the talented 10th, if you will. And that experience gets replicated in other organizations and other ways, and it also gets mutated. So you'll see, you'll see later in the presentation, there's gonna be people that are from further marginalized communities within the African-American community that then have their own structures and their own systems that very much emulate the traditional systems that they may have been raised in, but they do it for themselves. That is the most academic thing I'm gonna say. We're now delving into all of the nuts and bolts and, and how this stuff looks in a local level. And this, you know, if left to me and Zack Snyder, this will be a four hour presentation, but it is not. And I'm gonna keep moving as, uh, you know, as, uh, as best I can. So for the uninitiated, no pun intended, there's two types of black membership organizations. There are the collegiate and intercollegiate kinds, uh, such as general, also known as social fraternities and sororities, service fraternities and sororities and honor societies. And there are the community types, which would be your fraternal orders, such as the Freemasons, professional fraternities and sororities and LGBTQ plus fraternities and sororities as well as your social service and civic organizations. And I just noticed we have 60 people on here. Shout out to all of you. Thank you for logging in and participating. On the right hand, of, uh, right hand side of the screen, you have the Grand Lodge of DC building on 10th and U, which you may recognize if you are from or have been to DC. And on the left side of the screen, you have the spring 2010 initiates of Alpha Chapter Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. 
So some things my book is not going to are is not going to talk about. Uh, we're not going to really talk about black sports and athletic clubs. There have been books written about that, and I don't feel there's as strong a need to include them. Um, and they're also not intangible. It's based on athletic skill and interest. But there are books that are very good about the subject. Um, a Black alumni association of a school such as Dunbar would certainly be also of interest. And we'll talk about Dunbar in this presentation. But again, not the topic of this book. Your professional organizations like NABJ, Blacks in Government, don't really meet the criteria. And then your regular 501c, 501c3 nonprofits also not so much going to be included. And we're going to jump into the collegiate BMOs and we're going to acknowledge Howard and UDC as the incubators of Black Greek life. So I am going to ask, uh, let's see who's on here that I can call on as people start hiding themselves. Let's see. Everybody turn their cameras off. I can't, I can't see what I should call on. So those of you in the Black fraternal tradition probably know that there are several organizations that were founded at Howard University that make up five of the Divine Nine, and the Divine Nine being the National Panhellenic Council. Those are, as you see on your screen, Alpha Kappa Alpha, Omega Psi Phi, Delta Sigma Theta, Phi Beta Sigma, and Zeta Phi Beta. All wonderful organizations. But if you believe that only five, excuse me, five Greek letter organizations were founded at Howard University, in the words of my favorite Muppet, Oscar the Grouch, ding dong, you're wrong. There's actually more like 20 plus. The five that are mentioned are large and they are members of the Divine Nine, but there are Greek letter organizations that existed well before the establishment of Alpha Kappa Alpha. There are non-Greek letter organizations and this doesn't even count the social clubs at Howard, like Gentlemen of Drew or Ladies of the Quad. I want to bring to your attention that Howard University incubated such organizations as the Alpha Phi Literary Society, which was in the tradition of the literary societies of the day, but again, at Howard University. So there was an emulation of, and when I say emulation, I don't mean like, oh, Black folks stole this from white folks. It's much more of the idea that if a thing is good enough at a white college, it ought to be good enough to also be present at an HBCU. So why not? And that's Alpha Phi Literary Society. That is Kappa Sigma Debate Society, which grew into the Martin Luther King Jr. Debate Society. Then there's professional organizations like Epsilon Sigma Iota, which is, as far as I know, the first Sorority for Black Lawyers, established at Howard Law. In the 1950s, you get to the Hums, which became Wine Sci-Fi. And when I look at the Hums, New Gamma Alpha, Gents Limited, and New Lambda Bama sorority, we're now getting into a period of joinerdom, which is less about emulation, less about being part of a, a rigid stratification, and more about people having fun doing what they want to do in the ways that they want to do it. Now, you know, New Gamma Alpha still exists in some way. I went to Raleigh and saw somebody with New Gamma Alpha tags on their car, believe it or not. But these are groups that sort of pushed back against the norm and, and did their thing. Years later, you would find Shimsu Heru fraternity, which is, it, I would say, in the tradition of a Mal Malik fraternity, which was not established at Howard but is focused more so on African and e Egyptian symbology rather than Greek. And at Howard, the tradition continues. There's always something getting established there. The soil at Howard is ripe for these types of organizations. It, it just is what it is, it's Howard. And, and one of the reasons, and I hope I don't, I don't know if I say this later or not, but Howard at one point was the largest historically black college. 
So it wasn't necessarily just the level of prestige. It was that by numbers, that's where people were going. People went where it was safe. People went where people in their high schools had also gone. Just like how I felt more safe going to Georgetown because, you know, somebody else from my school had gone there and not been lynched, for lack of a better word, um, literally or figuratively. So Howard had the same thing writ large. But UDC is still in play at the time known as Minor Teachers College. So UDC has a special place in my heart because it is DC's public university and it is a historically black college. It is, UDC itself was the merger of four different universities with four different institutions. And one of the legacy organizations, one of the legacy institutions was Minor Teachers College. Minor actually banned fraternities and sororities until 1934, which we'll get at a little later. But at Minor, you also had the founding of Rho Delta Rho fraternity, Phi Sigma Phi sorority, and Lambda Phi Lambda, the first fine arts fraternity founded by Black people. So shout out to UDC. Then we get to community Black membership organizations. And my uh, subtitle there is, if I can make it there, I can make it anywhere. And by that, I mean Washington, D.C. If you can make it in D.C. as an organization, you have made it. At least that's what people that expand here seem to believe. So already, already when we're thinking about professional fraternities and sororities, we're thinking Iota Phi Lambda, perhaps the best known of the business sororities. But all the others also have chapters in D.C., and other organizations, the yes. Phi Delta Kappa, the sorority for teachers, Chi Eta Phi for nurses, Sigma Delta Tau for black male lawyers, Kappa, Kappa Epsilon Psi, women in the military, Gamma Xi Phi for artists. A little bias towards GXP, of course. But we're not just talking about Greek letter organizations. We're talking about Black fraternal orders like the Masons and those Masons that go on to join the Scottish Rite and the Shrine. We're talking about Masons that are not considered regular, like the King Solomon Grand Lodge on Rhode Island Avenue across the street from uh, Damien Ministries. We're talking about the Black versions of the Knights of Pythias and the Odd Fellows and the Elks. But we're also talking about organizations that were founded by Black people, like the United Brothers of Friendship and the Good Samaritans and Daughters of Samaria. But also, I want to shout out the United Order of Tents. If you Google the United Order of Tents, you will discover that they are probably the only Black fraternal order that was established by Black women that was not tethered to another organization. Okay, I, we can take, if you have questions about that, feel free to pin it and ask it during our question and answer session. Because I've also got strong opinions about uh, the auxiliary status of Black women's fraternal organizations. But outside the ceremonies, outside the other stuff that, you know, the parades and, and whatnot, there are some men's civic and social orders in D.C., Sigma Pi Phi the Boule is a fraternity, but it has more in common with civic and social orders, at least as they show up in DC. Uh, the Bachelor Benedict Club is a club that if you are familiar with DC politics, Brandon Todd is a member of the Bachelor Benedict Club. You have the Guardsmen, you have uh, the H HM Club of America, which stands for the Happy Men Club. They went and had a vacation several times a year with each other. Like some of this stuff was purely social. Some of this stuff had a lot to do with social uplift and service. Um, you have some organizations on this list where you had to be a member of one organization before you could join that organization. But that's the men. And you'll see that there's all things considered not a whole lot of organizations for men in the civic and social orders. But here come the ladies. All of these organizations have some kind of presence in Washington, D.C. 
They are, some of them are large and well-known like the Lynx. Some of them you might only know if you know, like the Northeasterners or the Moles. You might have an auntie that was in uh, the Drifters. But all of these organizations, except I think the Doll League, still have some sort of presence in DC. Some of them allow membership in others. So you might have women like the, the late phenomenal uh, Dr. Jeanette Hostin Harris, who was in the most organizations I've ever seen one person be in. But, um, but some are just remain small. Uh, one of my friends, his mom is active in Les Gym. And uh, he and I joked that we were going to be in the boy counterpart and we were going to call it Lay Him. But um, bum. On top of all those other groups, you have dozens upon dozens upon dozens of local, meaning not connected to any national organization except perhaps, you know, maybe leagues of clubs uh, that are in DC. And these are from all different time periods. The most recent one I've discovered is not discovered like in the Columbus sense, but that I've heard of is Dames, Divas Advocating More Excitement in Society. Some of the older ones, some from the 70s, Lay Girls Social Club, uh, the Piscians. Uh, the Cedar Mox is Comrades spelled backwards. And they do a book scholarship. They adopt communities in Northwest like uh, Shaw Junior High School. And my grandfather was a member of a social club called the Barons Nine. The unfortunate part about this kind of research is people don't typically join clubs with an eye for the future. So we may have people's grandparents, parents, great aunts and uncles who might've been members of these clubs that just didn't keep good records and nobody thought that those records should be donated to an archive somewhere. We, we would be so much further along generally in the study of black life if we knew how to locate these things. And really, God bless the Washington Post uh, for every now and then doing pieces about such organizations. And without that, I wouldn't have known about most of these. So the last part of this presentation, we're gonna talk about pivotal years and pivotal people. Uh, that changed Black Washington in, in the framework of Black membership organizations. 1825, Freemasonry free emerges among Black men. Now, I'm just going to say this, and, and, and you know, we can talk about it in Q&A or not. I don't care. I have a pretty fraught relationship with Freemasonry. I am a member. Um, I will delve into the genesis of Freemasonry, generally how it came to be in DC, and really what it looked like to have Freemasonry emerge before DC was its own political entity. Because you had a you had a lodge in what was then Virginia, and you had a lot two lodges which were in Maryland. So when the Grand Lodge got created, you kind of lost one, you gained others. Very interesting stuff. Not going to delve into it too deeply today. If you are studying organizations and do not mention Dunbar High School, then you have failed. So in 1870, this was a pivotal year because the Preparatory High School for Negro Youth opens. It becomes the M Street School in 1890, and that's the building you see before you. Those of you who are still in DC, you recognize this as the Perry School. Very historic building, not just because it housed uh, the former Dunbar High School, but because it's been used as a hub for the community for dozens and dozens and dozens and gener of generations. One person who we will discuss later was the principal of, the, of the, M, the M Street School at the time, Robert Terrell. But more importantly, I want you to understand that these organizations that we discuss were not created in a vacuum. These people came from someplace. Many came from Washington. And when you think about the founding of Alpha Phi Alpha and of Alpha Kappa Alpha, you have two members of the class of 1904, Marjorie Hill and Margaret Flagg. They were Dunbar women or M Street School women. And the year after them out graduated Robert Ogle and Nathaniel Murray, class of 05, who went on to co-found Alpha Phi Alpha. 
so you know we members of organizations like to tell these stories like oh visionaries they had this thought they had this idea well who's to say that they weren't influenced by their teachers or their classmates and by the looks of things it seems like i mean you know i'm not going to get technical but if they i'm i'm going to leave it there i think that men get a lot of credit for things that women step back and allow them to. A pivotal year, school year 1907-1908. December 07, Alpha Phi Alpha came to the campus of Howard University. The next month, Alpha Kappa Alpha was established, not because of the alphas, but after the culmination of a year of behind the scenes work by the women who would end up creating this organization. That's my pen and my books, guys. I took that picture. In 1934, Minor Teachers College ended the ban on fraternities and sororities, and that led the way to the establishment of not only those three organizations I mentioned before, but chapters of all nine of the Divine Nine between 1936 and 1977. This is important because as primarily a teacher's college, people that join these organizations then go on to become teachers and influence the next generations. Shout out to, if Dawn is still on the call, shout out to Beta Iota. 1968. <laughs> 1968 was important because the first, one of the first black gay social clubs was established by Howard University students and was called the Group of Washington. It was followed throughout the 70s by the Metropolitan Capitalites, the Associates, Five Plus Five, which was for men and women, the Pinochle Club, the Best of Washington. And really you have a straight line from the black gay social groups to black gay nightclubs to the advent of not only nonprofit organizations like Us Helping Us, established in the AIDS epidemic, but also DC Black Pride. Again, without the leadership of the people that associated themselves in the first place, we would not have these entities that benefit all of us. And here are some of the pivotal people. Um, for the AKAs that are involved, there's gonna be time for you to participate, so get ready. The first person I want to share with you, Robert H. Terrell, a, munici a black municipal court, municipal court judge in D.C. and only the second black justice of the peace. He was the husband of Mary Church Terrell, who was an activist suffragist and a club woman in her own right. He was a Mason. He was a member of Prince Hall Lodge number 13, and he was the grandmaster of Masons. I mentioned that he was also the principal of Dunbar High School. And it's amazing that the way that opportunities were for Black folks in D.C., you almost had to go through Dunbar, at least while you were looking for work in your field. So Robert H. Terrell, in addition to being you know, a lawyer and a judge, had also been a teacher and the principal of Dunbar. He co-founded the American Negro Academy. He was a charter member of the Epsilon Boule, which is another word for chapter of Sigma Pi Phi and he's an honorary member of Tau Delta Sigma Law Fraternity. I believe there is a junior high school named after him in DC. Daniel Murray, mentioned him before on this list, I really wish he was somebody that I had known. He was a historian on, and, and an widely regarded as an authority on African-American life. And he was an assistant librarian at the Library of Congress, a role that he had for over 40 years. He curated the colored authors section of the Library of Congress. And also like his personal collection got donated upon his death and created the Daniel Murray collection of pamphlets of black history and culture. He was a member of the Diamondback Club. This was a social club that met in members' homes and they ate turtle soup, guys. That's why they called it the Diamondback Club because they ate turtle soup. And I don't know how I feel about that. He was married to Anna Evans Murray, who was a civic leader in her own right, 
who was the driving force behind free kindergarten in DC public schools. And again, he's the father of Nathaniel Murray, who himself was a co-founder of Alpha Phi Alpha. Now, AKAs, get ready. Nellie Quander, someone also I wish I had known. She was the first international president and an incorporator of AKA, and she is credited with saving AKA in 1913. And she attended a meeting of women who were AKAs who desired to change the, the things that were important to them uh, into something that Nellie felt was demonstrably different from Alpha Kappa Alpha. And she was shocked, but in her words, she was what? AKAs, drop it in the chat. Shocked indeed. Horrified, thank you, Shante. She was horrified to discover that what she held dear was in danger of being changed beyond recognition. So she saved the organization by leading the way toward incorporation. But she was not only those things to AKA, she was a 30 year educator in DCPS. She was a safety patrol advisor for 25 years and she was active in the YWCA as well as union work. One thing that saddens me about Nellie Quander's life is that she died alone in her home in Northeast and was not discovered until a couple of days later. And it really speaks to how black, in my opinion, how black women of a certain age that didn't, you know, didn't necessarily have a husband were child free, not child less, but child free and lived their lives and, and, and did their careers only to, you know, not be discovered for two days. So um, she holds a special place in my heart. Um, and I think that she deserved better in her life. So here are the next steps that I am taking with this work. As you can see, this was over 200 years, this still down to 45 minutes, and there's still a lot more to go on my end. I'm not gonna give you more stuff today other than what the next steps are. Um, what I have to do next, I've gotta get more books. I have a lot, uh, you see them behind me, and I'll, when I stop the presentation, like I will show the section that is just black organizations. But I've got to get a couple more books out there that are rare books, haven't gotten them because they're a little expensive. Um, I've got to conduct interviews. There is a lot of living legends in DC that are part of these organizations that I will be uh, talking to about their experiences and really just cataloging their data. I'll be conducting surveys. I want to get in touch with more historians of these organizations to see what else is available. Um, you know, Google is not my friend. I get blocked for spam a lot. So I'm going to need assistance in getting introductions to people's chapter historians and whatnot. And on my end, I'm going to keep writing. If you are curious how you could help, this is the only commercial part of this, uh, this uh, workshop. Um, I do have a Patreon page. If you'd like to become a monthly donor or an annual donor, feel free to visit uh, my Patreon which is patreon.com slash Rashid Darden. And you'll see what other program, what other projects I'm working on creatively. This one is emerging as the front runner these days because uh, it's just, you know, nonfiction. You can really run with it. A lot of the books that I was mentioning that I am looking to obtain are available on Amazon. And if you want to shoot me an Amazon gift card out of the kindness of your heart, my email address is rashid.darden at gmail.com. A little bit goes a long way. If you're on social media and you see an interesting story about a Black membership organization, don't presume that I've already seen it. Go ahead and send it to me. We have a conversation about it. It might give me a lead to another organization or a person I should be researching. And just spread the word. If you, if you know older African Americans in DC, just randomly ask them, hey, are you in a sorority, in a fraternity or a club? You know, I know a guy that's writing a book on this. And, uh, you know, whatever, whatever other flattering things you want to say about me are up to you. But I would love such introductions as well as introductions to librarians and archivists. So final uh, updates about the book, if you will. I don't know what I'm going to be finished. I don't know. Sorry. 
but it is nearly 200 pages so far. I'm, I am happy with the progress. I'm happy with the structure. I am likely going to self-publish it. I do like the creative freedom, but I'm not ruling out a traditional publisher if by the end I'm like, you know, this could work. This could be something. Um, but if I do self-publish, I might have a fundraiser to secure the funds to get the reproduction rights to photos that are available in uh, the DC Historical, Historical Society, because they do have a lot of stuff that uh, would be helpful to kind of, you know, put in the book in terms of showing uh, pictures. The good thing is for a lot of the recent stuff, I'm a photographer myself, so I will be using a lot of my own photos. I would like to sincerely thank the Change Committee for Racial Equity. I put equality, my bad, for racial equity of the Friends Meeting of Washington. Thank you so much for giving me this space to talk about a topic that I didn't think was going to interest over 60 people. But thank you so much for uh, showing up. Thank you for attending. Thanks for holding the space. And a special thank you to anybody who is on this call that is also a patron of mine. I thank you very much from the bottom of my heart for all of your material support over the past nearly two years that I've been in Conway, and I look forward to your continued support. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see your lovely faces, and I would love to hear any questions you might have about anything I've said, anything you disagree with, um, anything that you'd like to know more about, and I'm going to start by scrolling through the chat to see if they're, okay. Elaine wanted to know, wait a minute. Okay. I want to double check. Okay. Elaine wanted to know why would a college or university ban fraternities and sororities? Why did minor then allow them when they did? Short answer is, um, nah, it's not going to be a short answer. There are colleges and universities out there generally that are rather paternalistic in the first place and have made a decision, well, these entities would not enhance our student life, so therefore they're no good for us, you know, whatever. Um, Georgetown has made that decision. There are, there are other universities that can do so because they're private. My educated guess about why minor eventually allowed them is because it was a public school. And, you know, you would eventually not be able to get away with banning people's freedom to associate from a public school. Um, that is a presumption, and I'm looking forward to doing more research on that to get a, um, to get a definitive answer. Um, but it is telling that within the first two years of the ban being lifted, uh, you know, the organizations began springing forth. And, and to my surprise, because many uh, teachers' colleges were mainly women, the fraternities really came up very quickly after the sororities. So that is my best answer to that question. Yes, Charnel mentions that one, that Terrell may have been named for Mary Church Terrell. And I, th I, th I feel like if it's not the junior high, then maybe it is, uh, maybe it was another institution named that. Pierce mentioned that his college banned, wow, there's 10 more messages, uh, banned them on the basis that they were playing a disproportionate role in the lives of students. I would say that that's the truth even in 2021. Yep. So um, Damani says one of Nellie Quandra's descendants attended Howard with him. And uh, that is Judge Rohula Mean Quander, who did write a book about Nellie Quander that I really enjoyed. Thank you, Brother Burris. Okay, so I have a private message. Quakers historically have avoided exclusionary organizations such as country clubs, fraternities, etc. cetera. Uh, I paint a very positive view. What are your thoughts about the people who don't get in? Let me gingerly pat the sweat from my brow. Um, I don't think about the people that don't get in. 
I am someone who approaches membership in my organizations in a very holistic way. I am not looking for people that earn a certain amount of money. I am not looking for people that only present a certain kind of way in terms of masculinity. The people that I have ever voted no on, I, and I'm speaking as Rashid Darden, not as a member of anything else, but is simply because they really weren't the right fit and really weren't pursuing to fit. They were pursuing for status reasons. They were pursuing because of what it would benefit them. Now, I don't write the policies. I don't tell people, you know, I'm not the person that tells people how to vote. So for sure, there's people that have been excluded because they are openly gay. I've been treated poorly because I'm an openly gay member of my fraternity. Um, but I think just as the battle to make Quaker entities less racist, there is a parallel battle among black organizations to make them more inclusive as well in their own ways. So I think just as Quakers, we don't necessarily broadcast, you know, how great we're doing at anti-racism. You don't also hear from black organizations like, you know, I mean, there's there's a black organization I know of right now that has an inclusive policy on trans transgender applicants. After having no policy for a hundred years, there it is. So the work is being done. I get it to the question. I know that I vote for sound reasons and that I, I check my privilege all the time in those votes. And um, it is, has been stated many Quaker colleges don't allow them. That's true. Black organizations will find a way though. There are citywide chapters. There are, there's associate membership and alumni chapters. There's regional membership. So if a college doesn't want to allow it, as long as they're not punishing people for doing things on their own time, I'm fine with it. Thank you, Tremaine. Bowden also banned them. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. Yes, so there's a private question that asks, are there certain number of groups that just existed for a small number of years and are lost to history? Most certainly, most certainly. The number one reason that, you know, you'll hear a lot of black fraternities and sororities say incorporated at the end of their names and, uh, and use the word incorporated as part of their legal name. One, that's because you know, it's more than a notion trying to get an organization incorporated in, in a racist society. So that's one thing right there. But the second importance about incorporation means it kind of exists, you know, forever, or at least for as long as you update the paperwork. And, you know, sadly, a lot of these small social organizations didn't never, you know, never got incorporated, didn't, you know, didn't think of themselves in the future tense. And I think if I was going to give advice to an organization that's founding today to think of yourself in the future tense. One of my, this research has been slow going for me because I don't want to leave anybody out. I really don't want to have to write a volume two of this, but I suspect I'm going to have to because people are going to go to their grandparents' attics and find evidence that they've been in these organizations. Michael wants to know how these organizations have evolved over time and what the future trends might lead to. Um, in short, get the book when it comes out. I will be sure to answer that. However, I will say that greater inclusion is how most of the organizations have been showing up. And those who do not make the attempt to be more inclusive will not survive. You can bet the house on that one. The biggest challenge so far in writing this, thank you, Big O, has been equity in the available data. I mean that on a larger level, meaning, you know, the way in which I can research Washington Post articles is a lot more efficient than how I can research the, the Afro-American. It's just the way that the stuff is set up. The Afro is free but I have to, you know, look through each thing individually. It's not always searchable, but also the equity in how people, well, also how important we feel each organization is. I think they're all important. I've been in this lifestyle since I was a child. My mom is a Delta. Like 
This has just been, you know, part of my life. But I've always also looked at every organization as equally important to somebody. And um, no, no matter how corny I might think that organization might be, I'm still going to respect it, you know, in that sense. Um, so the equity in that the media doesn't always see them the same way. They don't always see themselves the same way in terms of their documentation. Um, and there's probably more. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Latoya wants to know uh, expansion patterns. Um, basically, Latoya, I did have to stop somewhere in terms of how the scope of this project and even as tempting as it was to write about, you know, uh, the Prince George's County chapters and, and, and whatnot, I really had to keep the study of the organizations to Washington. Now, the migration patterns I certainly find interesting. And if they are germane to the overall story, I will weave in, like, because, you know, I'm Northampton County all day now. You know, it feels like I've been here forever. Um, but my family's from here, and there's just as interesting a culture and history about the movement of people from here to D.C., but it may or may not be germane to uh, the book that I'm working on. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Yinka. Thank you, Judy. Um, hopefully, we'll save this chat because I would love to to see that interview or to read it in the book that we've talked about, but also to maybe get a chance to talk to them uh, myself. Lopez wants to know, how hard has it been, been to find historical documents related to the various organizations? Um, so uh, Lopez himself has been quite instrumental in the work that he's done at Howard University in the library. Uh, because he is the captain of the digit digitization project there. And there, like, if not for Lopez and his team, I would not have the access to Howard University yearbooks. And honestly, there, if you if you pledge anything in DC, you're going to come through the Howard Library, Moreland Spingarn, and the team there is going to be very, very helpful. So the Howard documentation, by and large, has been great easy to find. The historical documents are there. Howard looks to its past in order to build its future. Shout out to them for that. UDC, not as easy to navigate. And of course, when you're dealing with dozens upon dozens of other independent organizations, everybody's going to treat their own historical documents with, you know, with various differences. My wish is that every organization would write their own history in a book form at some point. Private question, what was in the water at Dunbar for them to be so intertwined with Black membership organization history? Um, the shady part of me that went to Coolidge wants to say lead, but the scholar in me <laughs> who loves Dunbar and the people that went to Dunbar, such as Charnel Bryan, it wasn't really the water, it was, it was two things. There was only like two high schools for Black people, Dunbar and Armstrong, and the other thing being that D.C. teachers, whether they were Negro teachers or not, were considered federal government employees and the pay scale was the same. So if you were a teacher in D.C. and didn't do nothing else, you were doing good. So it wasn't so much that it was Dunbar. It was that there were so few Black schools and the pay was really good. So it was attractive to people that were upwardly mobile. These questions are amazing. Barbara wants to know, were, are these organizations all single gender? If so, what do you make of that? I'm glad you asked this because I'm going to make a statement that's probably going to get me expelled from being a Freemason. And to that, I'd say y'all can have it. Um, I see no good reason that a woman can't be a Freemason and be considered regular, right? There's a lot of stuff that I think that works as a single gender organization. I think that if a, an all-male organization is working towards gender equity in some way and is creating spaces within those fraternities to call other men to task for their behavior, and we're not just talking like, oh, we're a fraternity, so we're going to talk about sexual assault. Like, no, if you're a fraternity, you also need to be talking about gender equity, about uh, like 
about how to talk to men about stopping sexual assault and no shade to the, the any, this chapter that might be represented here. I'll be damned if you think it's a good idea to host a self-defense workshop for women before you have a workshop on how not to rape. Like, that's a problem for me. That's a big time problem for me. And I think, again, those organizations that don't make those changes aren't gonna make it and they shouldn't make it. But there should be spaces for men to challenge each other, to correct each other in peace and privacy for their own moments of growth, just as white people have spaces that might happen to be all white in which they can check each other on their growth. Um, but like I said, some organizations, they might as well be co-ed. And well, I'll leave it at that. Expel me if you wanna, you can have all this back. Why do I feel that so many members of these BMOs do not normally gravitate towards white civic orgs like Junior League? Junior League of Washington has only had two black women to serve as president in its 117 year history. And Michelle, I've got 30 more comments after yours, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think both of those presidents were only in the last 10 years, right? Um, so I'm a member of Alpha Phi Omega, uh, and that's what I joined first before any black membership organization. I wanna keep it really simple. Sometimes you don't want to be around other white people. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you see the benefit from it. Sometimes you're like, hey, a person's a person, whatever. Let's go to this, you know, this holiday bazaar. And I love the JLW holiday bazaar, as a matter of fact, we've been. Um, but, you know, it's about safe spaces. And I think when you're in a marginalized community, when you see, especially JLW being so big, like it doesn't necessarily give off safe space, especially in a city like DC where so many people are graduates of historically black colleges, work in black sectors, like, you know, kind of why would you go take the risk on your free time? Part of that is up to the white people that are members of their organizations to themselves be entwined into black life in DC, which I'm not saying is easy, but we live in the same place. Why don't I see you at the same places where I go? I'll, I'll leave that there. Thank you, Martha. Dawn, you already know. This was awesome. Thank you, Dawn. Michael, I wasn't there. I pledged in 2003. Yes, and Charnel, I really should have said that. Um, Dunbar is the first black high school in DC, first black public high school in DC. Lynn wants to know, members of these organizations can be extraordinarily tight-lipped in DC circles. Discretion is key. Have you come across that? And if you have, do you have a strategy on breaking that wall? I think that it, so I have a feeling that you're not necessarily referring to fraternities and sororities, but you're talking more about like the tents and the Boule and maybe the Lynx and other organizations that kind of have a reputation for being mysterious. Um, part of it is because their membership skews older, they just aren't plugged into social media. They aren't plugged into the idea that it's a good thing to promote yourself. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm gonna keep it like short cause like we, we have gone over the hour that I thought we'd be together, but I see 34 more messages. Um, I don't know that I would want to break the wall of an organization that doesn't want to talk about itself. That's probably not the, not the organization for me. Huh. Can white people be members of black organizations? Lose <clears throat> I'm not laughing at the question. I'm laughing at how you uh, preceded it. Um, yes, white people can join black organizations. Think long and hard before you do, because you will be asked why. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you for the private referral. Did I discover any black versions of private social clubs like City Club Tavern in Georgetown? 
Um, yes and no. So none that are on the level of private social clubs with real estate. That's that's what we're going to like. So city clubs. Right. So not so much. I think that I found organ, uh, social clubs that had that clout and heft in the community. Um, but they just didn't ha necessarily own real estate. But the LGBT organizations, like I said, they went from social clubs to, well, we should start a nightclub to we should do DC Black Pride. Um, but I mean, we know there's also racism in real estate too, right? So I suspect that might have had something to do with it. Although the idea of owning a building did easily transfer to uh, alumni chapters and graduate chapters of fraternities and sororities. So Mu Lambda has a house, Zao Omega has a house, all of that stuff. Books on the topic. Um, after you get my book or before as you lead up to it, I would say that the seminal books about the, uh, the topic of these organizations would be In Search of Sisterhood by... Um, Oh my goodness. Paula Giddings, In Search of Sisterhood is the best one that I've read, uh, just period, bar none. Then Gregory Parks is prolific. He has so many, I can't really narrow it down. Um, but, you know, he's, he's, he's good. He's good. I'm going to give him his props. Uh, the Boulet, Sigma Pi Phi, if you can get a used copy of one of their history books, they're quite interesting. Um, I, you know, this has nothing to do with DC, but I learned that the chapter of Sigma Pi Phi in Liberia was it all, all but one of their charter members of their chapter was murdered in the revolution, in the uprising in Liberia. And, you know, I think that's an example of an organizational trauma that you don't really hear about. And like just reading that, I was like, I cannot imagine losing a chapter of my organization because of, of a, an armed political conflict. It, it, was, it was heartbreaking. Um, I don't have much more to say about the tents because they are one of the tight-lipped organizations. I'm reading Michael's question. In short, I'm not studying the chapters in other cities, but the reason, well, I'm, I'm a native Washingtonian. Let me answer the international question. There is a growth. The Deltas just this weekend chap, uh, chartered a West Africa alumni chapter. And before and South then- And South Africa before well, that. And South Africa before that. Um, there is growth. Some organizations are better at that growth than others. But they are American. And I think it's going to be very hard to go truly global if an organization is not translating and if an organization is not finding more economically reasonable pathways to membership. Um, how they might differ in other parts of the country I'm from a large alpha chapter. The alpha chapter here is under 10 people. We don't mesh. We, it's, we, we tried. It, it's, it's a no-go for us. The pacing is different. And it's not unfavorable. It's just not what I'm accustomed to. Thank you, Malcolm. Oh, sorry, Barbara. Listen, I'm going to take that as we're going to wrap up right now. So we will save the chat. I will do my best to get into the rest of these questions and kudos and comments. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you for your support. And um, if I said anything to offend you, uh, please blame Friends Meeting of Washington and not me. No, I'm just kidding. I I'll take all the blame. And thank you so much again for the change committee. I really, really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Rashid. This has been extraordinary. Yes. You're all so grateful. Thank oh, you so can't much. can't wait for the book. Kevin, Thank you. So excited. Thank you. That was great. Thank, Thank you. you. Looking forward to the book. Y'all have a good one. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye. Thanks. Thanks.